Now, just a few small points because I don't think it's the most complex chapter, certainly not nearly as complex as what we're going to have to try and work through today. It seems to me that one of the things that he is suggesting, which was suggested already in the first chapter, is that the form of social relations, i.e. commodity, molds juridical notions as well as conceptions of personhood. And when he uses language like commodities can't take themselves to the market, their owners have to take them to the market. When he talks about commodities, then later speaking to one another, instead of viewing it only as, you know, a funny paradox, you've got these objects talking to one another, I think you have to read it much more as an indicator of the kind of social relation we're dealing with and the ways in which those social relations mold people's self-conception in very determinate forms. So the idea of the juridical subject that for him is a function really of this, not of the objects of the widgets, but of the commodity form of social relations. And in a sense, that's one of the things that he was talking about in this chapter. Uh, and when he refers to individuals as <coughs> mistranslated as personifications, as character masks of the relations, what he's basically signaling to us is that this is a work which is going to try to ascertain what the fundamental relations are and the way they work. Some of the other themes that, related themes that emerged in our discussion of this chapter was the idea that the, it's the double character of the commodity form that is <coughs> constitutive of an opposition, an overarching opposition of abstract generality and concrete particularity. And that, in a sense, this is something that, to some degree, was further developed by Georg Lukács in History and Class Consciousness. The idea here is not simply to get beyond dualistic thought. It's also not to declare dualistic thought as simply bad thinking, but rather to ground the kinds of dualisms that have characterized modern Western thought in the double character of the commodity form. So you're begin you have this sort of epistemological dimension. It isn't dualistic, it tries to ground dualism. And of course, to the degree to which it succeeds, it also implicitly separates itself as an approach from all approaches that make general statements about the nature of reality. Whether reality is dualistic, whether reality is totalizing, whether reality is multiple, multivocal. All of these become equally metaphysical statements from the standpoint of this kind of approach. I hope that that's, so it's a fundamental break, including with a great deal that comes after it. You know that the commodity as this dualistic structure is in his terms that then is picked up much more strongly later on by Adorno is the identity of identity and non-identity. It's not simply identity and then non-identity is something that undermines it, that deconstructs it, but rather that 
the commodity form itself is the identity of identity and non-identity and most thought, and he will do this with a whole variety of forms of thought, they shuttle between one and the, and the other pole. Now towards the end of the chapter, what we begin to get is the first hints that the, the section, the fetishism of commodities in the first chapter is not the last statement on fetishism. You remember I told you that that was added later, but rather that the theme of fetishism continues throughout this text. So for example, um, what he begins to suggest toward the end of this chapter is that as a result of this externalization, right, that the commodity cannot be at one and the same time a value and a use value as it appears, although it is both, that it has to externalize that character. To put it in the language of this chapter, the commodity cannot at one and the same time be a non-use for the, the, um, the seller and universally useful for everybody else. It requires an externalization. This externalization, incidentally, once again, this is not a historical account. This is a logical account that is going to try to reconstruct capitalist modernity on the basis of the commodity form. As a result of this externalization, commodities do not appear as values, that is, as forms of social mediation, but as objects that are accorded value. So that the idea that the commodity really is a thing is itself already one of the fetish forms. The other side of that fetish, of course, is that money is the ultimate expression of value. Okay, now, uh, so that by the end of the chapter, he touches upon two things that he then develops much more in the money chapter. One is that because money can, in certain functions, be replaced by mere signs of itself, it gives rise to another mistaken notion that it is itself a mere symbol. Now what he means by that, by mere symbol, what he means is that it is arbitrary, that it is an arbitrary product of human reflection rather than resulting from the social characteristics of the nature of the bond in capitalist modernity. So of course money is a symbol on one level. But in Marx's analysis, it's the necessary form of appearance of the commodity form of social relations. It is not simply, simply something which is established by convention to make life easy. But you'll notice in each one of these cases, the, what he regards as a misunderstanding is rooted in the form of appearance of the forms themselves. which he does, add, you know, which he elaborates at great length in chapter 3. By the same token, the other side of the coin of what I said before, that the commodity or commodities appear to be objects, is that gold and silver appear to have the quality of as money naturally. 
that it seems to inhere in them as gold and silver, rather than that simply being the externalized form of this abstract form of social mediation. Okay, that's as far as we got on the second chapter. So how does he begin? And we'll get to the issue of price because it's actually very important in this first part. The measure of value. Right, so his claim is that, I mean, he's going to deal with different functions of gold. And its first is that it is the material expression of the values of commodities, right? The claim is that it is not money that renders commodities commensurable, but the co quite the contrary, as he puts it on page 188, I believe, because all commodities as values are objectified human labor and therefore in themselves commensurable, they can communally measure their value in one and the same specific commodity. And money is what he calls the necessary form of appearance of the measure of value. Now, what that, this means, among many other things, is that each time when he says that it doesn't appear to be the case, you notice there is a play. He's calling it the necessary form of appearance then he says later on, as was quoted, that price, and, uh, that price and value do not coincide. So the lack of correspondence of price and value follows from the value form itself, the claim. Right? Um, now, money cannot directly represent labor time. And this is a mistake of all the people who do, like, labor chits. Why can't it directly represent labor time, according to Marx? So let's do away with the bankers. Let's do away with, with, you know, all these greedy people who are running around with money bags. Let's just give honest working people, you know, a script for the amount of work that, that they did. What's the problem with that here? Yes? When you sell a commodity, I mean the commodity in Marxist terms is both this particular product and at the same time it's a moment of a totality. Right? It's that moment of the totality which is expressed by the universal equivalent. If you had another form of mediation, you wouldn't need this double character. So, and again, this is not economics in that sense. This is an attempt to get at this peculiar nature of, of uh, the, uh, the nature of social mediation in this society, that is, the incongruity is rooted in the commodity's dual determination as a particular product and as a general objectified mediation. So money is the expression of the generalized mediation. It's the value dimension of the commodity. But what it means is that already there's a kind of a non-one-to-one -one correspondence. You begin to have this, uh, this separation. Now the price form of commodities is like their value form distinct from their palpable real bodily form. Right? And the price form is yeah. It's a value as expressed by money. Right? Now, what he's doing is he's playing with, but he's going to go deal with it. As you may or may not know, Smith makes a distinction between the real price of commodities and the nominal price. 
The real price is the price in labor. The nominal price is the price in money. But Marx is going to go much further than just make, make that distinction. But at this point, he's still trying to specify the various roles of money because the various roles, in a way, come into conflict with one another. So that money is a measure of value. It's also a standard of price. And as Marx puts it, it fulfills two very different functions as a measure of value and a standard of price. For the standard of price, a certain weight of gold must be fixed as the unit of measurement. But gold itself is a measure of value only because it itself is a product of labor and therefore variable in value. He talks about the price form and the, and the value form in two different ways here. One, which we've been talking about, is the quantitative incongruity. However, in this chapter, there's also a qualitative incongruity. Let me quote. The price form does not only allow for the possibility of a quantitative incongruity, I'm on page 197, between the magnitude of value and price, but it may also harbor a qualitative contradiction with the result that price comes altogether to express, I'm sorry, ceases altogether to express value despite the fact that money is only the value form of commodities. Things which in and for themselves are not commodities can be offered for sale by their holders and thus acquire the form of commodities through their price. Hence, a thing can, formally speaking, have a price without having a value. Okay, now, this raises a lot of issues that we can't answer right here. But I want you to at least take cognizance of the fact that what he is saying is that the actual operation of price in the world veils value. It doesn't tell us at all why he thinks that we should stick with value. But at least it tells you at this stage that he is fully aware of the fact that both quantitatively and qualitatively you cannot find a direct correlation between price and value. Things can have a price without having a value. The price of something, even if it has a value, can stand in a, a contingent relation to its value. So on this level, and this is just at the beginning of the chapter, qualitatively and quantitatively, looking at value as the measure, uh, uh, looking at money as the, as the measure of value, you have a price-value discrepancy which hides value. Let me go back two steps just to remind you of what I think he's doing. What kind of like the narrative strategy is here. One of the things that we talked about in the relative and equivalent form discussion in the first chapter and in the second chapter is how as a result of the externalization which is necessary of the commodity form Commodity no longer appears to be a form of social mediation. Rather, commodities seem to be objects that are mediated by something else, which is money. So that the idea that money is the mediator and it just takes these objects and mediates them, both is, according to Marx now, of course, is the logical expression of the commodity form and it disguises its nature. It's both. This is why I keep on saying that, uh, you know, Pache, the way most people have read the book Capital, it has to be read as a long, long treatise on fetishism, among other things. So here, 
the value form necessarily generates price as its phenomenal form, as its manifest form. And yet, the qualitative and quantitative incongruity of price and value means that the price form disguises that which it expresses. What you do is you go to market with your commodity, you get money, and then you go and you buy stuff with that money. Right? You, as commodity owner, are interested basically in getting these other commodities. Right? So what you have is, in his equations, CMC. Commodity, money, commodity. In terms of the material content at this stage, the movement is CC. Right? That's the Stoffwechsel where the metamorphoses are the ways in which it's effected. As I was saying two classes ago, the distribution of goods and labor is affected in very different ways in other societies. So again, this is hardly a theory of exchange in general, but it's a theory of capitalism. And it calls into question theories of exchange that are ultimately based on theories of capital, including theories that say why other things are different than exchange, because they're usually contaminated already with, with, with actually what are the forms here. OK. Um, now, in fact, as he goes on to say, we're not talking about individual one with their individualized widget going to some decontextualized market, getting some money, and buying food, right? But the same division of labor, which turns people into independent producers, also makes the social process of production and the relations of the individual producers to each other within that process independent of the producers themselves. Because we actually are dealing with the simultaneity of millions of these interactions. So that the independence of the persons from each other is supplemented by a system of all-round objective dependence. Right? And the last way in the world that you can understand this is by imagining barter. It's not. It has nothing to do with barter. Now, money and the on the one hand you're having an exchange, <coughs> right? The exchange is, as he puts it, a transformation of form. But now there's a peculiarity involved here. What usually happens to the commodity that is bought? It's consumed, right? What happens to the money? I can't, I can't hear you. Right, the money remains, right? The money doesn't disappear after that exchange. It continues. And we're going to have to see some of the implications of that, right? So there is on one level a symmetry, on another level a real asymmetry. When one drops out, the other continues.
and it's because of this the simultaneity of these interactions plus the nature of the externalized value dimension that he says then uh, around page 207 that the circulation of commodities differs from the direct exchange of products not only in form but in its essence. The exchange of commodities breaks through all the individual and local limitations of the direct exchange of products and develops the metabolic process of human labor. On the other hand, there develops a whole quasi-natural network of social connections entirely beyond the control of human agents. So that this is a form of circulation that is A, beyond the control of individuals, and B, it bursts through all temporal, spatial, and personal barriers. Okay, but once again, he's going to be telling us that quantitatively, throughout this chapter, each section has a qualitative fetish and a quantitative fetish. I don't know whether you, you notice, but if you review it, you'll see each one. First qualitatively and then quantitatively, the result disguises where he's coming from. So that if money really is simply the external expression of the value dimension of commodities, the total money and the total value have to be equal. But that doesn't appear to be the case at all. Why not? What are some of the things that he then introduces? For example, what is one, and it's only one, dimension or implication of the fact that as we were speaking about earlier, the money doesn't disappear. Okay? It doesn't disappear. What does it do? It gets exchanged or hoarded. Or... Forget about hoarding for the moment. Okay? It's used again and again and again and again. Right? So that a limited amount of money can express a greater amount of value. Everything then depends on turnover time. Right? That's even before credit, time is coming back in. The time, however, is at this point circular. Right? It's turnover. It's turnover time. There are a number of other factors. The only We don't have to walk through all of them. The point I am trying to make is that on the one hand, Marx is arguing that the total currency and the total value have to match. On the other hand, there is no way that at any given moment they are going to match. They can't. Maybe they could if money didn't, if money disappeared in the exchange, in which case it wouldn't really be money. Right? But the fact that it doesn't disappear means also has, carries with it immediately the implication that there's turnover. And then, of course, there's credits come due, etc., etc., etc. So that each theory that he's arguing against is a theory really in this section of the primacy of the means of circulation. And I want to suggest to you that his very peculiar language metamorphosis, the, the, the sort of di if value dimension flowing from one to the other, now it's commodity, now it's money, um, that that is an indication that when he opposes 
two theories of the primacy of circulation, the primacy of production, the primacy of production is not the primacy of the production of goods. It's not simply the pretty obvious statement that, you know, no bread, you're not going to get very far. It's really not that. Because you could make statements like that without using all of this peculiar language about metamorphosis. And since many Marxists actually really thought it's a primacy of labor because, after all, you have to make things in order to survive, they thought that you could just throw away the first chapters of capital because it's just kind of unnecessarily Hegelian, dialectical, obscure, and a pain. So we're going to take seriously this peculiar language that he uses and see if there's anything that comes later that warrants this, what appears at first glance to be a completely unnecessarily Germanic way of viewing, of viewing exchange. Okay. So we've done turnover time. And now, yeah, I think we can move on, I think, to coinage as the sign of value. And we began to talk about we began to talk about this already. Uh, you know that the use of coins and the fact that over time coins no longer contain the amount of metal that they say they do. One way of viewing this instead of just, you know, how monarchs from time immemorial have debased the coinage and somehow this is deeply immoral. And the standard of morality has always got to be the gold and silver. It's a very interesting kind of morals involved. Instead of that, what he's saying is, he's just looking at it differently and he's saying, Look, what this means is that the coin is a symbol of itself. And that the fact that it actually contains, um, you know, 0.8 pounds of silver rather than a full pound of silver really is irrelevant. It's only when it gets down to, you know, 0.01% of silver that it might, it might, not always, make a difference. But once you have that, logically, then you could just substitute something else for the actual coin. If a debased coin can represent a pound, so can a piece of paper. And if a piece of paper can represent a, uh, you know, the, uh, the coin, so can anything else. But notice what he is trying to, and all of this is not proven in this chapter, what he's trying to do is argue this is not simply convention. Yet, he's not proving that it's not simply convention. So that if value is an abstract form of social mediation, which is constituted by labor playing a very peculiar role in capitalist modernity, then what the money basically is, is the materialized representation of a form of mediation as a representation of a form of mediation, it itself, it's silly to think that it necessarily, therefore, has to be bound to a particular material form. Because that's not what money is, according to him. Now you'll notice that this isn't simply an argument of how you can get from value to paper money in spite of what a lot of people think. 
But there's also another dimension to this. I want to come back to my suggestion that all of this is about unfolding fetish forms. When gold functions as the means of circulation, gold itself has value. Once, however, we get to paper, what you have is a relatively valueless object serving as coins in the place of gold. So that means that something which is valueless is representing value. But because it's valueless, this is another step in the veiling of value. Right, so all the way through this chapter, both quantitatively and qualitatively, he tries to indicate that starting with value, what you're going to get are forms that appear to contravene the existence of value. Does this make sense? And I think it's very important always to read this, really not as an economics, but also as something which is, in a sense, it's covering its own tracks as it's moving. And it's rendering plausible, I mean, he's engaged here implicitly with a whole range of mo money theory of the 18th century and early 19th century. But just as with Smith and and labor, he's also trying to talk about the conditions of possibility of this form of thought. The widget that you brought to market is qualitatively specific, right? It's particular. And you just hope that, you know, somebody wants to buy this widget, that it satisfies some need, right? But it's the, the value dimension, the whole point of the value dimension is that it is qualitatively general. That's the whole point of it. Being qualitatively general means that it's purely quantitative. It's not qualitative, it can't be. If it's qualitative, then it has to be particular. But the kind of generality we're talking about is an abstract generality. It's an abstract homogeneous generality. Being an abstract homogeneous generality, incorporated or expressed as money, means to the degree to which money expresses that, it is by definition boundless because it's pure quantity. This was coming back slowly to the point, to the point that you raised. Does this make sense to people? I mean, all of these things are tied together all the way through. Right, this is what value was about originally on pages two and three and four of the first chapter. But that's the whole point. There's no qualitative specificity. That's the whole point of abstract human labor. Two. That was the whole point of my saying earlier that the commodity is at one and the same time qualitatively particular and abstractly general. And that that opposition itself is, by Marx, grounded in the commodity form. But abstractly general means really abstractly general. It means it has no bounds, logically. At the same time, he is not saying, you know, monetarists belong in, you know, some playpen or insane asylum. He's saying that the forms themselves are generative of this understanding. But in fact, the actual amount of money is not equivalent at any given time to the total value produced. It's not. So the discrepancy isn't a misunderstanding. But 
time and time and time again, and what makes Marx very difficult, is he keeps on saying that the one thing you cannot do is judge things on the basis of surface data. You cannot do that. I mean, you can, and then you're going to get theory A and theory B that are going to contradict one another in systematic fashion. Okay, so in a sense, what he's done until he reaches means of payment, the first section of money, is that he locates the, the precondition of hoarding in the two metamorphoses of the commodity. Right, that there isn't an immediate coincidence between buying and selling. The producers must have sold without buying in order to be able to buy without selling. Right, so uh, the fact that you sell without buying so that you can buy without selling means that you're trying to hold on to something. And that's the sort of bottom the first level of the way he deals with hoarding. Then uh, what he does, and we'll s the means of payment I think is a very interesting thing and I don't want to do it in three minutes. It's the effects of a time separation between when a commodity leaves the hands of the seller and when its price is actually paid. Okay, so we're going to do that and having done this and having sort of realized that already on the level of, of money, value theory just doesn't seem to be valid on the basis of value theory. I mean, that's part of the strategy, of course, is to show that you can derive that which apparently contravenes your presuppositions from those presuppositions themselves. It's a very Hegelian move. Yes, no, maybe. Then we're going to start with capital, which at first is going to seem incredibly obscure, but I'm hoping that the scales will begin to fall and you'll be able to see why this book is actually called Capital and it's not called commodity. Even though so much writing about Marx, it used to be just that the book should have been called Manifesto. Uh, that was for two generations. Then, it, you know, more recently, it should have been called commodity. But it's not. It's called capital. And we're going to try to figure out why it's called capital.